Okay, good evening. I'm Steve Shields, a Vice President of the Royal Asiatic Society, Korea. On behalf of Brother Anthony, our President, welcome to our 1,424th lecture since 1900, marking the midpoint of our 120th year. Yes, I've been back through all the records and counted how many lecture programs we've had, probably because I don't have enough to do during Corona. Uh, the RAS uh, wants to thank our generous sponsor, Asia Development Foundation, for their second year of support. We are delighted to have Joey Rosatano with us as our lecturer. Originally from Nashville, Tennessee, Joey came to Korea in 2006. He's joining us tonight from Jeju-do, where he has lived for several years. He spent the past 10 years studying shamanism and has become a leading expert on the sea women, or Henyo, of Jeju. Joey's new book, Jeju Island's Henyo, a user's manual, is available for Kindle on Amazon. After Joey's lecture, there will be time for questions. So if you will now please make sure your mics are muted to reduce background noise. We will hear from Joey. All right, hello everybody. Um, yeah, here I am uh, <clears throat> on Zoom from Jeju. It's uh, nice and rainy, pretty humid out. Well, I think it's cleared up a bit. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, I will, uh, you know, I will uh, kind of refute the designation as a uh, expert on the Heino. Uh, I have done a book on the Heino recently, um, but uh, I did, I, I've studied shamanism on Jeju for the last uh, 10 years. And this book on the Heino kind of came out of a situation where I thought that uh, the Heino were getting so much uh, worldwide attention and coverage, but they weren't necessarily getting, uh, you know, uh, a fair representation as far as it went from their own perspective. And the reason that I knew a lot about the Heino's uh, personal perspective is because for the last years, uh, informally and formally doing research and just kind of uh, kicking around the island, I've uh, had conversations with the Heino for 10 years now. And I've kind of, uh, you know, before they kind of became um, UNESCO sponsored and so famous, uh, you know, and known worldwide through, uh, you know, the projects, photography projects and the novels that have been written about them and the other projects. Um, I heard a lot about their uh, kind of personal attitudes towards, uh, you know, transitioning to that period where tourism was increasing on Jeju and uh, where they were getting, becoming kind of a symbol of the island. And kind of their inside perspective was a lot different than the way that they were uh, shown to be from the outside. So what I've done is I've done a book that has, uh, I, think, I think there are 12 interviews with uh, three generations of women divers. Um, the generation from 60s to 80s, and then uh, the next generation, 40s and 50s, and then the children of the the divers and grandchildren of the divers that have either chosen to continue being divers or have uh, chosen other life paths. So what I've got for you today, um, I'm just going to kind of uh, lead you through the content of my book. And uh, the first section here is uh, just kind of an introduction to some of the culture of the divers. And then after that, I wanna go through uh, some quotes from my book and then I'll play a reading uh, if we have time, I'll play a reading of one of the essays. And I guess the chat's open. So as we go along, if you guys want to type some uh, some questions in or some comments in, I can re I can respond to those comments. I don't I don't really have uh, the structure of this is kind of all over the place. So I'm I'm just gonna you know throw it out there uh, just kind of piecemeal, and uh, hopefully we can have a conversation uh, about uh, the project. So, and the project now is an ebook on amazon.com, but it's not actually finished. I, I, uh, it's missing three interviews, which are more going to be from the perspective of women divers who become leaders in their communities. So there's one more chapter on a woman diver who ended up becoming the mayor of her town and uh, bringing windmills. Uh, she was kind of integral into the process of bringing windmills to her village. 
And then a couple other women that might have a bit different perspective uh, uh, than the women in this book do. My uh, friend's been calling this book uh, a people's history of women divers. So uh, <laughs> maybe my politics are showing uh, through a bit there, but I, but I have to say, you know, this kind of uh, environmental, uh, you know, environmental activism and, uh, you know, critique of gentrification, that type of thing. I, I really didn't find any women divers that, that held a different perspective. They're, they're all very skeptical of how, you know, they're gonna end up benefiting from tourism and from, uh, you know, all the development that's happening in Jeju. So the, the interviews in this book are pretty fair, I think. And uh, I'm, I'm desperately searching uh, for women divers who have a different perspective, but it, it's, it's hard to find, uh, as far as that type of thing goes, it's hard to find uh, the, the opposite perspective. Um, there, uh, as far as all the other topics that uh, I talk to them about, you'll find a variety of personalities and a variety of uh, stances and experiences. So there's not really, uh, I wasn't trying to make like, uh, you know, to shape uh, the narrative other than that kind of uh, political, like let's look through the tourism, let's look into the structure of what uh, gentrification is doing. Other than that, these other type of things, uh, I just kind of let the women speak uh, and, and say what they wanted to say. Um, I've spoken uh, with women divers, uh, you know, before I did these interviews, probably kind of informally for eight years. So a lot of the stories from the essays are things that I just heard along the way, you know, just uh, stories that I kind of got into when I got into the villages and just interesting things I heard about. And from my own curiosity, I wanted to learn more. Okay, so let me try to share this uh, PowerPoint. Let's see how to do this. Okay, share screen. Okay, are you are you guys seeing a PowerPoint or are you seeing my yep, face? We're, we're up, we're up, your PowerPoint's up. Okay, good deal. Okay, Jeju Islands, Hanyo, a user's manual. Okay, uh, this is kind of uh, the intro to the book. I'll just read the uh, first couple of paragraphs here. Ever since Jeju Island has forged its way onto the international tourism scene, its women free divers called Hanyo have taken center stage as both cultural symbol and tourist attraction. The divers fame peaked with their designation as intangible cultural heritage by UNESCO in 2016. Uh, the honor garnered worldwide attention for the incredible grandmothers of the sea. But what do these women of newfound international fame who speak an endangered language and practice an ancient free diving lifestyle have to say about their own popularity. What is the current situation for the Hanyo really like from their point of view? And you guys can kind of uh, examine the rest of this later. It's, it's on the, uh, yeah, the Amazon page there, just the uh, book description. Okay, who am I? Uh, I'm Joey Rossitano. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I've lived in Jeju for uh, I think 13 or 14 years. Uh, I don't go to Seoul much. If, uh, if I'm in Korea, I'm pretty much in Jeju. This was kind of my uh, Korean hometown. Um, the rest of the country is a little bit foreign to me. I'm very uh, much adapted to the way that people speak in Jeju and, and the culture here. I take trips to Seoul or around the country or outside of the country uh, now, and, now and then. Uh, I work at the local college uh, teaching, uh, just teaching kind of uh, IELTS testing and conversation classes. Uh, I'm not an academic, but uh, you know, I've, I've been doing research and kind of producing documentaries and projects, especially about shamanism for the last uh, 10 years. So uh, that's something I gradually got into, but uh, that's another story. So I can talk about it another time or if you guys have questions later. Okay, so I wanna start with some uh, facts about the Hanyo. Uh, these aren't any, in, they're in no particular order. So uh, I'm just gonna throw them out here. So, uh, okay, so, the first one here, uh, tradition dates back to around 434 AD. Those are the first records anyway. 
but no one really knows uh, when this tradition uh, started. And of course, it wasn't only the women diving back then, it was the men diving as well. And, uh, you know, I've got fat and protein are easier to capture from an ancient sea than hunting or trapping. We have to think that the, you know, the sea even 50 years ago was much different than our sea today. Um, you know, there was, uh, it, it, it's pretty easy in Jeju to go into the water with a spear. Uh, I've done it myself and come out with a fish uh, 10 minutes later. It's, it's very easy to do that. It's very easy to get, uh, you know, protein, I think, and fat from the sea a lot easier than hunting on land. So, you know, there are divers in Taiwan, there are divers in uh, Eastern Russia, there are divers in Japan, of course. Um, I think that, uh, you know, down into Africa and Southeast Asia, in some areas, it's the men that dive, in some areas, it's the women that dive. I, I think that this is uh, probably something that human beings um, uh, have, have carried on, like it was, it was a life way for many, many, you know, thousands of years. And Jeju is just one of those areas where it, it, it still remains, probably because of Jeju's isolation and, you know, the history with uh, colonization and, and uh, the kind of price hikes for seafood from Korea in that time. Okay, so in the early 70s, there were around 35,000 divers. Uh, there are around 4,000 now. So most of the divers are uh, 50 or above. Uh, a good portion of them are in their, you know, 60s and 70s. Uh, still most local people, even in Jeju City, have divers in their families or relatives who were divers at some point in their lives. As in the 70s, it was somewhere, uh, somewhere around a tenth of the population on the island. Okay, so since uh, so many of the island uh, dove, you know, just in recent decades, uh, if you live on Jeju, most of the people you know will have a connection to, a, uh, to women divers in their families. It's not rare at all. Uh, most people have at least one grandmother who's a woman diver. Uh, the next point here, uh, men. Men used to dive and still do on a limited number of islands off of Chujado. And uh, the researcher at Jeju National University, Go Guang Min, has investigated these islands and, and write about them. So Go Guang Min, he set out to figure out, uh, you know, exactly why the men stopped diving and why they kept diving in certain areas. And uh, I'm not really sure what his conclusions were, but I know that he, uh, he you know, covered that, uh, that topic, although it's, it's still a bit of a mystery and I know there's uh, debate about it. So Heijang Cho did a study of Udo uh, in 1979, a very famous study, of course, on the sexual division of labor uh, in the most traditional village she could find, which was one of the villages on, uh, it's actually the village that the, the woman on the front cover of my book uh, lives in on Udo Island. And she notes that men used to die, but were prohibited to do so when Confucianism was brought and intensified on Jeju. Uh, the arrangements she describes are something I can see many aspects of in couples I know personally on Jeju Island. So this, uh, couples who aren't involved in fishing or diving. Though, uh, so this is, uh, this is something if you live on Jeju Island, you'll definitely notice is that uh, there's an awful, you know, as, as Cho described in her famous study on Udo Island, which was the most intense version of this, uh, on the island, the, you know, the women took kind of the primary role as far as like the breadwinners for the family. And the men were often housekeepers or did a little farming on the side and they often took care of children. And this is something you'll still see on Jeju Island with men who have nothing to do with fishing and aren't from fishing villages is that they're uh, very tender with small children and you'll see a lot of uh, men still taking care of, of small children, especially elderly men. And uh, it's also the case, I don't know the statistics on this, maybe they're not significant, but I think anyone who lives in Jeju would know just from walking around, it's really amazing how many businesses are run by women still. Um, I've seen many cases of this where, you know, uh, even people who have nothing to do with diving who live in the inland villages as well, where the, where the woman is the ma main breadwinner and where the men are kind of playing a more supportive role. So there is, uh, there is that reality. It, it shifted a lot. I mean, uh, Jeju is a lot like uh, mainland Korea now, but there's, there's uh, some remnants of that kind of culture still. 
Okay, so the origins of why men start, uh, stop diving, I believe is a bit disputed. Uh, she gets into the importance of Confucian rights and the role men play in performing them and caring for children. Okay, yes, yeah, so shamanism, uh, which is what I study, and uh, Confucianism are very important on Jeju, but the Confucianism is not the Confucianism that you would find on the mainland. It's very much uh, infused with, uh, you know, shamanic practices. And uh, that's something that is very striking to mainland uh, Koreans when they come to Jeju. All right, so the next point I have, uh, the Hanyu have had a, uh, a long fight against national tariffs and taxes on their work, and even today must do battle with price setters. Their work is also very territorial and competitive. Thus, divers have a great ability to fight and argue but can also skillful, skillful, skillfully reach settlements to disputes quickly, which, in, which is aided by an almost anarchistic local government system within their villages. Diver communities have long uh, set their own rules through their collective diving associations and police their own diving activities by assigning special monitors in certain villages to make sure divers are following the seasonal restrictions for catching certain food. This is something I thought about uh, recently in America with this kind of, uh, this, uh, this uh, chaz and chop and these kind of like, uh, you know, these declarations of, of these kind of, uh, maybe kind of anarchistic uh, collectives and occupations of neighborhoods. You know, someone, uh, someone should do that work on, on Jeju's villages. It's, it's really amazing. I mean, the central government here and planners in recent, recent decades have done everything they can to kind of wrench the power from like uh, the local villages and the village leaders to the extent where culturally Jeju is divided between East and West. But, uh, you know, about a decade ago, they split the island into North and South and uh, they kind of centralized the power between the main two cities, uh, Jeju City and Sagipo. And that, that caused, that definitely was a, a, a movement that uh, kind of uh, disempowered locals to, you know, protest and stop a lot of these big developments that are unwanted in their villages that are coming in now. I mean, that was, that was they, they consulted American, you know, economic hitmen type, I guess, or whatever you want to, whatever you want to call them. But this was a very deliberate action on their part. Um, I think uh, my buddy Tommy Tran has written about that a, a bit, but uh, a researcher at UCLA. Um, okay, on the next uh, point here, on the tendency to fight. Okay, yes, you will see many fights in Jeju's villages. Uh, you will see uh, the sweetest, uh, you know, kind of characters erupt into uh, disputes and things like this. And to outsiders, it looks very intense, but they're able to turn up the heat uh, very quickly and then they're able to turn it off very quickly. And I believe this is a cultural thing as well. In my time on Jeju, I've seen a number of conflicts taken on by the Hanyo. I've also seen them organized to oppose a tourist hotel development, a naval base in Gangjung village. Presently, there are several struggles going on, including an occupation of the provincial government building by the Hanyo and their allies against the proposed second airport. I've seen them physically take on tourist diving operators from the mainland where they threw the divers equipment into the sea and some of these battle uh, some of these battles of which you can read in my book. So a lot of times these kind of uh, these struggles between you know uh, people with agendas from the mainland or from the central government here in the Hanyo erupt in uh, violent situations. There's an occupation at the provincial building that's been going on uh, two years now. It's really amazing. Uh, there, there's a tent city there and uh, you know it's, it's uh, at first it was the women divers and farmers from these five villages that were opposing the second uh, airport project on Jeju and now it's the Jeju Green Party and other kind of interested uh, people who keep the occupation. And sometimes there are women divers living there, but usually the, the younger people will kind of uh, hold their places and they'll come in on weekends or on off days when they're not working. Uh, that they've kept it up during coronavirus even. So, um, you know, there have been concerns about that. Uh, you know, elderly uh, women gathering together, uh, you know, um, in that situation. Uh, luckily, we haven't had too many cases here. 
Okay, moving on. Uh, next point, while adept at handling disputes, Hanyo are generally very sweet and have been as curious about me as I was about them during my research. Uh, but also in the many years of casually talking to them, most have been very willing and proud to help me document the shamanic village myths I've made ext extensive records of. And then, the, uh, and this was for a new project to address issues with the commercial uh, commercialization of the island and their image. Okay, yes. Yeah, so uh, I, uh, you know, I didn't find um, a very much resistance to uh, these new interviews and what I wanted to do with them. Uh, most of the women divers were very uh, happy to talk to me uh, about these issues, and you know, there. This is kind of a hidden side of what's going on in Jeju and. You know, a lot of women, uh, these women are really suffering in ways. Uh, some have benefited, but, uh, you know, to, to a large extent, they feel like some of their issues are being ignored. And it's not just the airport villages. It's spread all over the island. It's, uh, you know, there are different issues uh, all over the island. Um, so uh, there are two or three areas that are having uh, issues with uh, pollution, you know, runoff from the hotels and such things. And it's so, it's so intense that uh, there start to be issues with like uh, skin conditions and uh, large die-offs of, you know, the sea life there, which, which you can read about in the interviews. Um, okay, Hainio, Hainio, a user's manual, the name is taken, uh, this is about the book from French writer George Perec's Life, a user's manual. Uh, it's a book that goes behind the structure propping up uh, tourism and the capitalization of women divers image to allow them to address in their own words the number of issues they are facing and uh, in what is quite possibly their last decade. Um, so there are a few essays as well which I wrote with the intention of portraying the environment of a village and the interviews themselves uh, that the interviews themselves couldn't uh, um, encompass. The portrait of a whole village or how the legacy of war, the forced divisions, the anti-superstition movements, and shamanism plays in the village. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, you know, Jeju is a traumatized community because of, uh, I, I don't know how familiar uh, you guys are with, uh, you know, the April uh, 3rd incident and the massacres uh, that happened on Jeju Island. But most of these women uh, have family members that suffered. And if, if they're old enough, they were either teenagers during the time or in their 20s um, when that struggle occurred. And there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of uh, issues that kind of remain on the island uh, because of that. So that's something that affects uh, the personalities uh, of the women as well. Um, OK, moving on. Uh, during Japanese colonization, the economy started to spike for the Hainyo. Uh, Jeju researcher Go Guang Min also writes about this in his book on Jeju traditional lifestyles. And though there was a lot of abuse of the Hainyo when they worked ab abroad uh, in Japan by their managers and contractors, they did manage to begin to be the breadwinners of their households. Uh, Go points out that it was uh, the price hikes in seaweed during the colonial period which funneled money to Jeju's villages. And this is also where the money came from uh, that allowed divers to send their sons to university, uh, mostly in Japan, who returned to Jeju to lead the rebellion after the war, uh, which played a part in leading to the events of the 1948 uprising. So it kind of, uh, at that time, a new educated class uh, of uh, people formed in a lot of these, you know, the women divers uh, were, you know, kind of an economic powerhouse at the time. So they, they were able to, uh, you know, they were kind of the first to be other than the old upper class of Jeju to kind of uh, uh, encourage their children and send their children to school abroad. And uh, yeah, that's something that's still going on. Um, after this period, the women kept paying the tuition of their children and grandchildren. Even today, you will meet divers. And this is an inspiring thing uh, to be on a boat of divers who brag about all the fancy universities their children attend all over the world. I often ask my friends if their grandmothers could help pay for their education or the launch of a new business if they are, if they are at a loss for options. It's not a strange question on Jeju. You'll meet uh, husbands and grandchildren in my interviews whose educational expenses were paid for by women divers. Okay, so yeah, in my book, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple and uh, 
uh, they're in their late 70s and the lady is a woman diver and her husband uh, was a local high school teacher. And I mean, she, she paid for uh, uh, his education. And that's, uh, that's, that's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, grandmother's money is kind of a, a resource for young people on Jeju. That's an option, uh, you know, to help uh, funding a project or, or, or new business or purchasing a house or uh, what have you. Uh, the next point, women divers are a lot of fun and to watch what they do is really amazing. Uh, they aren't Amazonian, uh, Amazonian women. And for the most part, they seem to really enjoy their work. Uh, many are addicted to it. And this, in my opinion, might be an actual physical addiction, especially in the days before modern wet, wetsuits, but that's for another day and I'll get ahead of myself. Uh, some elderly divers dive for the enjoyment of doing so and not for the money. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of representation of women divers uh, struggling and, and the hardships, and, and they do. They have a lot of uh, uh, diving-related health issues, and they're, they're elderly after all. But uh, to be in a group of women divers, uh, a lot of the time, uh, you'll, you'll notice that they're having a really good time. And, and not a single one from my book uh, said that they didn't enjoy diving. Uh, they actually said that it was one way that they were able to be with their friends. It was a way to socialize. And there are divers that still need to dive for the money. And then there are divers that don't, uh, you know. So those divers that don't, uh, they, they believe that, uh, you know, it's, it's a healthy thing to do to keep working. And uh, it's, it's something for their own happiness to be able to socialize with their friends. Um, yeah, so young divers generally work to provide a main source of income for their families, along with farming. Uh, every diver that I interviewed asked me to tell the English speaking world that they are happy people. Uh, uh, they are happy that people respect their work, but to say that they are above all normal women doing a job. And uh, every single one said that. That was the main message when I asked them, what do you want to tell the world? Uh, we're not super women, we're normal women. <laughs> but they're, they're pretty super though, they're pretty super if you, uh, I mean, they're, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're doing something extraordinary. And like I said, I, I think it's something that uh, lots of uh, uh, people did from many communities all around the world. I, I think this just in our modern era happens to be a kind of holdout. Uh, it is, of course, uh, an incredible job. Okay. Uh, the next point is about when I first came to Jeju. Uh, when I first came to Jeju, I saw a woman diver. Uh, I, when I first came to Jeju, I flew to Jeju uh, with just a, a day or two's notice. I was living in Spain and uh, I didn't really uh, plan to come to Korea. I knew nothing about Korea. So, uh, and I decided not to look up anything uh, before I came as well, because uh, I just had an invitation to come. So I got on a plane and I came to Jeju. So within the first couple of weeks, I was uh, on a bus, I think. That's why I put if my memory serves me. And I recall seeing uh, a woman come out of the ocean in a diving suit with her husband, helping her to carry seaweed. So I, I actually wrote down in my notebook the name uh, of the closest business I could see because I thought there was this really eccentric couple that were wearing wetsuits and kind of uh, gathering seaweed from the water. I, I didn't know that it was a, uh, a normal thing that people did for a pro profession on the island. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, the women divers weren't as advertised, uh, you know, uh, 14 years ago as they are now. So even though it was kind of my experiment to come without knowing where in the world I was going, it could have it could have been possible to come to Jeju and not know that they existed, but uh, yeah, I thought uh, they were just an interesting uh, group of people that I wanted to meet. But then it turned out it was a uh, substantial part of the culture. Uh, the next point: I didn't want to do a book on their divers because starting four or five years ago, uh, funding was going around and everyone was doing projects on the divers. Uh, in a roundabout way, I did do projects on the divers back then because I suggested two project ideas to friends, a fashion book on granny fashions, which has come out, and a series of large scale portraits that were brought to fruition uh, by another friend. So even though I didn't want to follow the crowd, I guess my mark is there somewhere. As far as the fashion goes, Jeju's Hanyo do accessorize. Sometimes they decorate their floats with floral patterns and they tailor their suits with similar patterns. 
uh, some wear protective bracelets, charms, and nowadays, if they are going to be interviewed for TV, they will do their hair, et cetera. All of the women divers also told me they hate to be you know, photographed while they're working, uh, you know, sweating, and it, it's, um, it's kind of an awkward uh, thing for them to see. You know, in the case of one of my friend's mothers, uh, you know, her portrait went around the world in museums and it was like, I, I think it was like 30 feet high or something like that. So this, this woman saw, you know, in her work clothes, this big portrait of her that was, uh, you know, 30 feet high in the local museum. And, and you know, th this is, uh, it, it, it's kind of a, a, they've never wanted to be shown in, in that state. They want to be shown when they're wearing uh, their proper dress clothes and stuff like that. So that's something that uh, they've had to adjust to. And some women divers get really angry about being photographed. Um, the next point here, there are lots of uh, trinkets for sale on Jeju now featuring the Heño and lots of art featuring their image. Uh, some divers I've talked to uh, like the items and think they're cute, while others are frustrated that they don't benefit financially from the sale of these things. Some of the art is to the diver's taste, but there are also uh, big fails in this. For instance, uh, there were a set of murals featuring the lyrics to a traditional diving song, which tales of, uh, uh, which that should be T-E-L-L-S, tales of a woman diver diving at sea on a wall right where the Hanyo went into the water. Okay, so this was the situation in this village, uh, Gimnyong, and uh, I guess some artists had been hired from the mainland to do, uh, to do murals uh, in, in the village, but right at the, the kind of, uh, right in the area of the sea where the women would kind of line up to get in the sea in the morning, these uh someone had painted a mural that had uh the lyrics to a traditional dirge about a woman diving at sea and apparently it was really uh and, and they'd done it in jeju dialect and anything you know so uh and everything so apparently it had uh it was kind of creeping out the women as they went in the water to see this kind of funerary song uh you know on the wall right where they were entering the water so sometimes there's this uh you know, lack of cultural communication going on that backfires a bit. Um, all right, uh, speaking of songs, okay. Traditional women divers sang rowing songs when they went out in their boats on longer voyages, especially. But today, most divers would see the songs as cultural relics, though there are many women divers who can sing them still. Uh, Mikhail Karikis, you guys might know this guy, has done an interesting film on this and other projects on other work song traditions in the world. Uh, the lyrics are really interesting from these songs. I think there's a collection of the songs uh, available somewhere and they give insight into the Heño's collective experience. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Next, the reason I decided to do Heño a user's manual was because over many years of watching these projects come out, many projects were funded by the provincial government during the preparation for UNESCO sponsorship. And almost none of them, uh, and I said here, I believe it might be okay to say none of them. Actually, no, I thought of one of them. There was a, a, a photography project about the, uh, the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of city beach here in Jeju and it kind of showed the uh, the women kind of dealing with the uh, you know the pollution in the water there and the kind of just facing kind of the the neighborhood converting into a tourism-based economy as, as opposed to a fishing-based economy. Um, I can't remember that fellow's name uh, but yeah there was one project but there's been hundreds of projects about the uh, about the divers. And uh, there weren't many projects. There was that one project that I know of that really delved into the challenges of gentrification and environmental decline affecting the divers. And not only this, but uh, a number of land grabs and the desecration and removal of their precious shamanic shrines, which was, of course, the, the thing that I was looking into the most, all the while using their image to drive tourism. And much of the time, they saw no returns from these ventures or the smaller ventures run by back to lander types or others from elsewhere in Korea who relocated to Jeju to buy coastal properties. Uh, I wanted there to be a record of these phenomenon, which for local Jeju people would be the main thing going on here in this era. Uh, and I'm not quite done. I'll add a few uh, interviews and updated versions. So yeah, um, I really, uh, like I said, uh, 
I came to Jeju first. That's where I know in Korea. And it was important to me to uh, show from their perspective uh, these big changes that are happening in Korea how, or in Jeju, how they actually feel, feel about it, because a lot of that doesn't get transmitted. Uh, and let's see. Okay, so the book for the moment is a self-published book as it started as a collection of blog posts. Okay, yes. Yeah, so this, this started uh, on PaginsWeAre.com, which is my blog. And I started covering all the villages where shamanic shrines were being destroyed, and I wanted to document those. And uh, I was kind of the first locally to document um, situations such as, you know, there was a village called Yere Village where a, uh, you know, a, a hotel complex came in from Malaysia and one of the women divers, the, uh, the, the UNESCO sponsored Yangdung ritual the the shrine at which they do this unesco sponsored ritual was destroyed for this hotel complex uh no one had consulted the divers about it um a kilometer or two from uh uh sunrise peak in uh Sungsan village there are three shamanic shrines that were destroyed just a half a kilometer from the unesco uh, protected land and property and the women divers were never consulted about that and they were told to uh, shut up. So um, that situation is covered in the last interview of this book. Okay, so I think I've got a couple more points. Uh, here's some basic things. Uh, these are women divers. Uh, sorry I didn't uh, include uh, more photographs. I was kind of uh, against taking photographs of women, of women divers because you know, they're so, um, they're so kind of overwhelmed with people taking photographs of them now that it was a, uh, you know, it was a bit of a benefit in my own image to not have a camera and not take pictures. But I did go on the boat and take pictures a couple times. And uh, in, the, in the situation where shamanic ceremonies are happening, plenty of uh, pictures, but of course they're not in their diving gear. Uh, so these are two, this is a mother and daughter uh, getting ready to dive for... Uh, uh, I can't remember what for. I think they were diving for um, uh, sea slugs, maybe this day. I'm not sure, but uh, something specialty. And uh, so I snapped this uh, picture from a boat. Uh, so here's some basic things. Uh, the Hainu start diving when they are very young. It's usually gradual. Uh, it starts with play by the beach fronts and starts turning into diving. Uh, that's what all the literature says about it, uh, you know, uh, everything, it, but it's true, they, they all tell you that. Uh, around five or six years old, they start playing around the water, and then they, uh, they kind of gradually begin diving without even knowing they're doing it. It's, uh, you know, they're kind of going in the water more and more the older they get. Then around puberty, actual training starts. By the time they are 20, they are uh, full-fledged divers. Most divers are in their 50s, 60s, and up into their 80s. They generally, uh, they generally dive around three hours, going up and down constantly with a few breaks. Each dive can last 30 seconds or up to uh, two minutes. That's, that's not very long to hold your breath for free diving. Uh, that, you know, uh, the Greek stone divers, we're talking like 20 minutes, right? 10, 15 minutes. Uh, you know, this, this is actually, but, but the catch here is, is that they, they do it consistently over three hour period, up and down, up and down. It, it's absolutely amazing. They, uh, they have a lot of stanima. Uh, some younger divers stay in the water longer. They have a specialized breathing technique. Uh, yeah, I've kind of been looking into this breathing technique a lot, but I won't talk about it here because it's a long story. And they gather shellfish, top shell, conch, abalone, octopus, various types of seaweed. Uh, seaweed is for food, dietary supplement, supplements, and a gunpowder element during the wars. And it has other industrial uses, fertilizer as well. Uh, sometimes they spear fish. Yes, yeah, so the, 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 the women divers of, of, uh, of um, Korea were supplying the Japanese military at, at some points in history with it, with this uh, whatever element comes out of uh, seaweed, which I'm not uh, that familiar with uh, the particulars of that. Okay, uh, just about done here with my points. Hanyo uh, form mental maps of underwater seascapes. This is really interesting. And the rocks and parts of each village beach has their own names and often mythology to go with the rocks that have unique formations. They learn the details of every part of the ocean 
and know where all the underwater features are and they can point them out from the shore at high tide. So if you ever meet women divers, a really interesting thing to ask them is uh, to explain to you their beach. And, the, and they'll probably say like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's water, it's a beach. And you're like, no, no, no. I mean, what is the geography, the underwater geography? Uh, you know, uh, in every, a lot of, every kind of uh, significant area of the beach and every large submerged stone has its own name. Uh, just like in inland Jeju, every single field in a Jeju village has its own name and often a story or some type of mythology uh, associated with it. And it's the same with the underwater landscape. And uh, a lot of women divers have personal experiences and the anchor point for those personal experiences can be that uh, particular feature underwater. So, uh, you know, um, they could kind of uh, relate to you, uh, you know, something significant that happened to them, uh, where at what time, like seeing something very strange in the water at some point or uh, having a near death experience or some type of accident or, or uh, whatever, or, or kind of a mythological story. Um, the seafloor is often seen as a field and diving is seen, seen to be farming of the ocean and the sim symbolism and myths and types of sympath sympathetic magic and divination during shamanic ceremony, uh, ceremonies show this. Farming deities are sometimes even related to Hanyo work in the Yangdung ceremony, which is a significant ceremony welcoming the Yangdung gods. They have it on the mainland as well to Jeju, the kind of gods that plant uh, you know, the sea life, uh, they very much see it as like a, a field being fertilized to produce new life. Uh, these deities are seen as seeding the ocean floor with a young sea life. And there's a photo I was going to show you, but it's not here. So uh, it was a photograph of a uh, part of a shamanic ceremony where there's kind of a map of the sea floor uh, laid out on the ground. And the shaman is telling the women divers uh, where the fishing is going to be good for uh, that that part of the year, but uh, I could not find it in time. So sorry to not have that available for everybody. Okay, and the last point is about religion. So Hanyo may practice Christianity, but most are shamanic and Buddhist and practice Chesa, which is led by the men, but mixed with shamanic aspects. This is a very, uh, this is very serious on Jeju and a, uh, a priority in island villages. Many divers are women of great faith. Yeah, I call uh, some of, you know, when I go to a Jeju village and I'm researching shamanism, I'm looking for what I call like the shamanic holy rollers. And it is, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, uh, you know, a place that has uh, some pretty wild uh, sects of Protestant Christianity. And it has some really, it has, uh, you know, I'm familiar with uh, people who are really charged by their religion. And uh, some of the women divers in the villages are, uh, you know, uh, very much uh, those types of people. And, I, and I, I'm familiar with that kind of, um, you know, with that possible aspect that uh, people can have about their personalities for sure. Um, okay, so uh, here's a couple photographs. Uh, this is one of the women that I interviewed. Um, she's the woman diver on Jeju who's leading the fight against the second airport. So she's the main organizer of women divers in five different, uh, five different villages. So uh, if the second airport comes into Jeju, uh, right off the bat, you're probably going to uh, uh, lose three or four hundred. This is, I don't know, you guys probably aren't familiar with this issue, but it's, it's probably the biggest issue on Jeju Island right now. Um, about uh, maybe four years ago, it was announced that a second airport was going to be uh, built on the south side of the island to give access uh, to Sungsan, the kind of UNESCO natural, natural like sponsored part of the island. And, uh, you know, the majority of islanders are against it and definitely the five or six villages that will be um, kind of taken over by this project have been, yeah, you wouldn't believe it. You, I mean, they have occupied uh, the uh, provincial building here. Um, and like I said, the divers were first and this lady had a lot to do with that. So, um, and uh, it, I'll, I'll get to some quotes by her in a, in a second. Um, I was talking before about um, the, uh, the trauma that uh, people have faced on Jeju Island. And I wanted to, um, 
I wanted to uh, I wanted to show this picture. This is a picture of, uh, of school children playing on a playground in uh, Bukchan village in Jeju uh, on kind of the north side of Jeju near uh, Hamdok Beach, if you've been to Jeju before, one of the main tourist beaches. And uh, this, you know, on this very schoolyard, uh, this is where uh, one of the biggest kind of incidents during uh, the April 3rd massacres happened. And, and I think uh, three or 400 people died here. And uh, just beside their grandparents' graves, this kind of mass grave that's just in the field bes beside the school are the grandchildren and great grandchildren of, uh, of the victims of these massacres who are playing here. So uh, yeah, I've, uh, I, I did a little project where the, the um, there's kind of this, uh, you know, of course, the women divers and the elderly people are suffering from the direct trauma of, the, of what happened back then, but there's also kind of a generational trauma going on, and each generation deals with it in its own way. But this was uh, interesting to me because these, uh, on, in, in the kind of uh, children's society of Jeju, there's also, uh, kind of a way through rumors and storytelling that the children track and, and kind of convey uh, the events of uh, the 4-3 uprising where 30,000 people were, uh, if you guys know the story, were killed um, by uh, national, you know, police and like uh, central, the central powers uh, by uh, national forces. And, and uh, most, most of them innocent villagers who had no idea uh, that, that what was about to happen to them or weren't directly involved in the rebellion. And uh, these kids kind of have a, a culture uh, where they kind of uh, tell stories almost like ghost stories and uh, little anecdotes and stuff. So I, I actually have some drawings made by children and uh, they've drawn where they believe the graves to be uh, located underneath their school. Um, there actually aren't uh, graves located directly underneath the school, but there are graves nearby. So it's really interesting that the, the kids kind of have, uh, and this is something I've observed without, without initiating it. I've just heard them, uh, uh, when, I've, when I've taught kids in Jeju, I've heard them kind of uh, talking to each other about the massacre. Or once I was in class and the kids were, uh, they were saying, uh, it's 4-3, it's 4-3, it's 4-3. And there, there was kind of an uproar. And uh, I, I said, what are you guys talking about, you know? And they said, uh, uh, we didn't get to eat lunch today because something was wrong in the cafeteria and we're all, we're all starving, so it's 4-3. So it's kind of, uh, you know, they had like these little jokes or, or uh, these kind of like uh, this, this culture of their own where they kind of uh, process the trauma. And of course, there's a lot of workshops and stuff for them on the island that uh, help them kind, uh, you know, that educate them and teach them how to deal with these things. So that's something to, uh, to keep in mind if you're ever, you know, interacting with uh, doing research in Jeju, uh, you know, that that's the most significant thing uh, that that kind of happened historically in, uh, in their lives. So um, here's just a couple pictures from the research I normally do, uh, you know, Jeju village shamans. Uh, on the left is uh, Grandma O. Oh. She's the kind of head shaman of Sewa Village. She died a couple years ago, but she was the uh, most. Uh, she was the oldest shaman. She was, uh, I think, 95 maybe when she passed away, and uh, she was retired. So she was really kind to me and and uh, uh, kind of brought me in and taught me a lot about Jeju mythology. On the right hand are her two students. So this is the present head shaman who's being uh, dressed in the uh, traditional sacrifice cloth here. And then uh, her student, uh, who's actually from the mainland, but has learned Jeju shamanism, which is not uh, an easy thing to do. Um, here are a couple women divers from Udo Island that I interviewed um, and uh, had a really good time interviewing them. Uh, their interview is in the book. Uh, this is a picture I took that I thought represented uh, my book very well. Uh, it's a statue of a woman diver and uh, a tourist uh, taking a selfie in front of the uh, statue. So, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, and this is, uh, this is a documentary, if you're interested in shamanism, on Jeju Island that I did a couple years ago about, uh, 
about, this is the first part of it, um, the story of Jeju Island shamanic shrines where I, uh, there, there's, uh, this is mostly the inland villages, not the women divers, but uh, this is kind of the, uh, a tale of, uh, of the culture of worshiping uh, trees at tree shrines in Jeju and shamanic practices. So uh, let's see, how are we doing for time? It's 8.19, okay. Uh, I can't see, are people making, uh, are they making comments and stuff? I can't see, uh, I don't um, have anywhere that. There, there's uh, there's uh, one question about uh, asking if you did the interviews in Korean. Ah, uh, yeah, I did them in Korean, and uh, my Jeju dialect is very broken, eh? So, I mean, I understand Jeju dialect, but I don't speak well, but I, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I only will uh, have someone go with me to do interviews if, if it's a uh, particular situation where I'm, for example, when I went to meet the leader of the, of the uh, airport protest, I went with uh, a translator because just the technical details of, you know, uh, the history of the protests and their strategy as far as opposing uh, the airport and stuff like that. I was worried I would miss some details. And also for rapport, that would, I've never met that woman before. So a lot of these people that I interviewed were long-term friends or acquaintances or grandparents of someone I know. Uh, in a situation where I don't know the person that well, I may go with someone, just a Korean person, just to try to, um, you know, dispel any suspicion about my purposes, you know. So, but usually it's not a problem. And uh, so here, uh, these are the, uh, I think the time's getting pretty late here. So I, I'm, I'm just going to go over the, uh, the contents of my book here and uh, just kind of tell you who these people are. Uh, so it's broken into sections, interviews and essays. Uh, the first interview, uh, Kyung Jin Park uh, is a young diver in her 40s. So this, this is very much someone that, uh, you know, I'll drink beer with. And a uh, normal uh, woman who's of her generation and her job happens to be woman diver. And, uh, you, you know, um, someone her age doesn't speak uh, much Jeju dialect. Um, well, they do, but I mean, they're not, they're not really of that generation. They're more of the uh, generation that has cultural access to mainland Korea. You know, they, she had worked in Seoul, she'd done other jobs, she went back to diving because it made sense. Uh, she told me to work uh, three hours a day uh, with young ch children versus uh, working eight hours a day for less pay. Uh, next is a conversation with artists. These are granddaughters of uh, divers who do um, annual uh, kind of art uh, uh, exhibitions about the goddesses of Jeju, about the mythology and goddesses. Um, next is an essay, The Diver Who Tried to Die at Sea. Uh, this is an essay about a woman in her 80s who wanted to... Um, she kind of toyed, uh, well, she, she dove into her late years much more so than, than uh, longer than her family thought she should dive because uh, there was this uh, arrangement on Jeju where, policy on Jeju where if a diver that died at sea, the families would get a better stipend uh, than a diver who just simply retired. So this, is, this essay is about, uh, you know, uh, in this uh, village near Jeju City, uh, it, it's about the family trying to coerce this elderly diver um, to stop diving and her refusing to do so, which she did refuse to do so and has uh, refused to do so since. Interview Udo Island Divers, uh, those two ladies, I showed you a picture of before, these ladies from Udo. Uh, Young Kim, she's a sociologist who specializes in um, gentrification and her and has done work on the gentrification of Woljung village in Jeju, where uh, 80, I think like 85% of uh, the beachfront property is now owned by outsiders. And uh, she wrote about, uh, she did her master's degree on that topic. Her, her, uh, 
she's not the granddaughter of a, of a diver, but her grandfather is actually the harbor master, which is, you know, a, an important position in, in, a, in a village, uh, Jeju village. Kyung Ron Han is an activist diver. Uh, she's the lady uh, here leading the uh, rebellion uh, against the airport. Um, let's see, uh, essay, Jiang Destroyer of Islands. Uh, this is kind of about, um, about an artist, daughter of a diver. And it's kind of about a generational trauma, I think, and uh, the trauma she has inherited from her mother. Uh, Bile Bile Beach of Death. Uh, this is about, well, I might, I might, if we have time, I may play you guys an excerpt. I don't, I don't think we'll have time though, but uh, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll post this. I've, I've got an excerpt of uh, a reading of this one, but I might post it to YouTube or something if we don't have a time. But uh, that's about, um, uh, the rivalry between two villages during the uh, the April 3rd uprising, so uh, in 1948. Unji, feminist journalist, she's a uh, journalist, daughter of a diver who writes for a, a magazine, fashion magazine in Seoul. Um, this is about her identity complex of being a Jeju person or a, a Seoul person, as she, as she says. Uh, Jihi, she's a Seoul City public official, uh, granddaughter of a woman diver. Um, she also talks about the development of Jeju and kind of her own culture class of uh, clash of, uh, you know, uh, functioning in the big city. Uh, Ji Yun is an activist journalist. This is a, a, a woman who returned to Jeju, uh, I think from Iwa Women's University and she returned to Jeju to uh, take part and is one of the main activists against the uh, new airport. And she, she came here specifically for that purpose. She returned to Jeju. Essay, grandmother. Joey, Joey mm -hmm. let me interrupt. There's a lengthy question that's been uh, typed into our chat. Okay. You mind yes, sorry, I can't see that. Too. Yeah, I, uh, in the 1980s, I used to see Henyo in Pusan, uh, in Yangdo. Would they have been local or do Jeju Henyo go to work in other places? How are they organized? Are they freelancers? Do they organize to secure the best prices for their catch? Multiple part question. Okay. We're all yeah. waiting for the great answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the women divers, uh, yeah, they do work elsewhere. And uh, what they do is they, uh, together in their own village or sometimes with uh you know villages work together and this is especially the younger divers who do this who are really ambitious to make a lot of money they uh hire uh boats themselves and they have areas uh they do go around busan um they go to uh kind of islets off of jeju and around korea where i i don't know how they get the rights to fish in these places this i do not know how they do that um, but they go to different places, and uh, I believe the boat owners get 30%, I believe. I can't remember, 30 or 40%. And, but the, the take is really good on these types of uh, trips. And uh, they, gen they generally go for a few days or even up to a couple weeks. But, you know, these, these practices are changing. A lot of the women uh, worked in Japan. Uh, and they also uh, worked along with, uh, you know, AMA with the Japanese Hanyo uh, in their villages. And I'm not, I'm not sure the, the technicalities of that. But yeah, they, they could have been Hanyo. I, I thought that Busan had native Hanyo as well, um, or it would have. Uh, the majority of Koreans Hanyo were in Jeju Island, but there's always been Hanyo kind of uh, in, in that area, I believe, in the Busan area around there. So I, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, the, uh, there's not a, there's a standard agreements within, like I was saying that there's kind of this anarchist vibe about, uh, about the villages. There's kind of standard agreements uh, within regions, you know, and the price, the price differences and that type of thing will, will, uh, will vary. I don't know much about the price setting. I, I don't know much about how that's done. Yeah. So. Okay. Grandma, mm. Thanks. Go go ahead and uh, uh, tell us about Grandma Bondari. 
Okay, Grandma Bondari, this is an essay about a uh, shaman. Uh, it's, it's about uh, a shaman's relationship with the Heno. And there are a couple more uh, uh, village shamans here, uh, interviews with them. Uh, this is a really important uh, part of their culture and life. And the very last interview is with uh, a retired diver talking about, um, you know, talking about uh, the uh, destruction of the shamanic shrines on the island. And the very last thing that I will leave you guys with is I will give you some uh, quotes from the book, from the different characters from the book, and then I'll be open to whatever discussion or whatever questions that you have. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, the first interview with a diver in her 40s, a younger diver. So at first, when I went into the water, I couldn't stay in very long, but my mother taught me the correct methods. My mother went out with me and stayed at my side. Uh, a little bit about the transmission of, the, of how to dive there. I only know diving and it is my only job. I spent long years learning techniques and having experiences to learn what I do. I can't just get on the TV and speak about being a woman diver unless I have the experience, which means extensive experience and study. And uh, she was kind of saying that to uh, pit herself against the, the kind of uh, women from the mainland who come to play to uh, take the Heino diving school and they don't really become uh, divers. You know, obviously these local younger divers are jealous of these women coming in from Seoul and stuff like that. Most of the women who come in from Seoul don't become divers in the end anyway. So, uh, but that's her own perspective of this. Uh, the truth is, I'm the same person in the water and out of the water. I'm just a person trying to make a living like everyone else. Don't think of me as a woman diver. Think of me as a person. I heard this type of thing a lot. Uh, and uh, yeah, since, you know, since their image is, is being used so much every day. Uh, Okay, this is from the artist interview. There's a lot of people who take interest in what we're doing, studying and making art about mythology, about culture, but it seems like they are just interested because they want to make money off of it. So a lot of these uh, local experts on culture and local artists, uh, they are consulted because, you know, the owners of guest houses or uh, someone with some type of business venture wants to use the symbology of Jeju to, uh, to, to sell their business. And they almost always get it wrong, you know, so that's, that's the complaint there. Uh, they went, okay, this is the Udo Island from the, these, these ladies here. Uh, they went into the cold water in every town. We managed it with our thoughts. We told ourselves, withstand this because this is how you survive. This is how we gain our living for the food we eat. You tell yourself, I have to withstand this. This is about diving before wetsuits, diving in the middle of winter uh, before wetsuits. Uh, we don't think that we are superwomen. We think diving is our job and our duty. This is how we make a living. If you breathe underwater, that's it. If you breathe underwater, you'll die for sure. There's only one chance. If you see the person beside you in that situation, if you grab them immediately, you can save them. If you can't get to them, they won't make it. This is from uh, this uh, sociologist at Jeju National. Uh, I think the important thing in this situation is the objectification of people's specific spaces, their land and landscape and that kind of thing. I think Jeju's Heino are a very important symptom of the tourist gaze. During the 1970s, the Heino were seen as sort of an amazing phenomenon, women who worked so hard and held their breath for so long. There, weren't, there were many researchers who saw them as almost holy, Many of those people gave them an artificial image. There are a lot of chemicals used in the agriculture running off from the farms into the ocean. The chemicals affect the well being of marine life. Swimming past the areas where streams meet the sea, divers can take note of this. We can't manage to make a good living. I'm telling you the truth when I say this. We are going to fight until the better, bitter end. Kyung Ran Han, second airport activist diver. Um, okay, and this is from the, the, the leader of the uh, opposition, the Hanyo opposition to the new airport, this lady. Um, uh, she's talking about when, when reporters visit to cover the Hanyo. 
I like it, but when journalists report on us for their own benefit, it's not good. When they come to the village and report on our real lives and our struggles, well, more of that would be good. Oh, the women divers are UNESCO divers. Oh, the women divers of Jeju Island are strong women. Oh, look how amazing they are. I'm not interested in that sort of thing, but coming here to the village to hear of our troubles and letting the world know what's really happening with us, I support that. We're here diving and fighting the second airport in, in the evening after we get off from work. People need to know that. I support those who are covering that issue, but oh, boom, look at these women divers. I have contempt for that sort of thing. I don't like it. Personally, I think that Jeju Islanders and people from Seoul are very different. Jeju is a very small society, so people are very tough and rumors th make things challenging. In Seoul, you can be anonymous. Okay, so uh, yeah, a lot, of, uh, a lot of Jeju young people, they are in jail. They are in jail, you know, it's a beautiful island, but uh, you know, not all, but some, they have their sights on other places, bigger places and bigger opportunities. I don't feel any particular strength being a woman from Jeju, but I heard about that a lot when I was young. They always said women were strong and diligent. So I have the image of strong women, but on the other hand, I think this strength they talk about can be related to patriarchy too. To me, it was so normal. I lived in the countryside and almost every old woman was diving or farming. So it wasn't special, it was just life. Uh, Jihi, Seoul public official. My grandmother was a diver. My grandfather was a PE teacher and all my uncles on my father's side are good at swimming. It's not just from my grandmother. There are swimmers in my whole family. This lady, uh, she uh, was a bit of a small time competitive swimmer. And so I asked her the question, I said, if you, if you ever went to the Olympics, you know exactly how they would sell, you know, you know exactly what this would be. It would be, uh, uh, you know, the, the granddaughter of the women diver is swimming in the Olympics, you know, on the national team. And uh, she, she got angry. I, I learned from my father, not from my grandmother, you know. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's interesting, uh, this other, the flip side of people who grow up uh, in, in the culture. You know? uh, this is Ji Young. Uh, she's uh, the younger woman who returned to Jeju from Iwa to, to fight the airport. Uh, activist, journalist, surfer, entrepreneur. She, she has a surfboard company. Uh, uh, I was too young to understand why we had to stop surfing, but later I realized it was because of a large resort, resort called Phoenix Island uh, that was built. The water used to be such a brilliant emerald color, and I saw the water's color change over time. I, I saw it too. Little by little, I became interested in why the environment was changing for the worse in my village. I started asking myself, what can I do about this? Uh, she's talking about returning to her hometown. But there were some things that shocked me. For instance, I came home to find there was a Starbucks here. I couldn't believe it. I kept saying to myself, there are a lot of tourists here now. A lot of foreigners have come too. I had the same feeling that I had when I lost windsurfing. I felt like I'd lost my neighborhood this time. And uh, one uh, final quote uh, from Young Cho Kim. He's the head shaman of Hamdok, uh, a man in his 50s. People perform uh, the, labors them, the labor themselves, but they believe the gods give them the power to do so. Uh, they believe if they pray to the shrine gods, they will never lack for food or the means to live. It's the person who does the work, but they have the gods power to help them. People have absolute faith in this. Uh, Young Cho Kim, traditional village uh, shaman. And this was uh, uh, an essay I was going to play for you, but uh, I think I'll post it on the page maybe from YouTube. And if anyone wants to listen to it later on, uh, they can. It's about uh, 15 minutes long, perhaps. And uh, this is the one about uh, a rivalry between two villages that started during the war era, uh, between two gr groups of uh, women divers. And uh, this was the piece of property that they were fighting over that the, this, uh, this, uh, this is a, that's why it's called a bile. This is a, a, a bile, it's a large expanse of basalt. Uh, it's kind of the working area for uh, Jeju women divers if they're not lucky enough to have a sandy beach. So, but it also keeps, uh, you know, outsiders out of their territory because it's pretty, uh, the, these things are, can be, you know, 
three or four kilometers long at, at times. So uh, yeah, and here's two ladies uh, going out to, uh, to uh, harvest, uh, well, to seed uh, sea urchins. So the plant sea urchins. Okay, and I think hey, uh, we've got lots of comments, uh, Joey. And okay, yeah, I'm I'm done. So uh, yeah, we could uh, let let me read some of these that have been posted on the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, James Turnbull says I have some pictures of Pusan Henio from the 1950s, so they've been around th since then. Uh, 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 Catherine Cinnamon says yes, and in the film Village by the Sea, filmed in Pusan, very interesting talk. Thank you, beautiful. Uh, another comment, I remember reading that Huang Young Zhou, 1992 Olympic marathon champion, was the son of a Henyo. Do you have any evidence that Henyo are genetically gifted endurance-wise? Okay, well, uh, interesting. I, I would imagine that they are, and, you know, the, the largest body of research, uh, some, someone even told me the only, you know, the the body of research which has like major significance is on the the physiology of the Hanyo. Uh, uh you know uh yes uh of course the successful women in the villages would i guess would have been selected over the thousands and thousands of years uh uh where the the strongest women in the ocean are the most successful because there are classes of Hanyo. so the way that uh, the villages, uh, the way that they divide, it's a little bit different in each village, but the common thing is, is there's an upper, middle, and lower class. And these classes are assigned different parts of the ocean. So if you kind of rank into the higher uh, class of women divers, uh, you're gonna make a lot more money than the lower women divers. And if you meet women, if you meet women in a village who weren't able to dive for some reason, uh, say they had some, uh, you know, uh, so for some physical reason, uh, you know, years and years ago, they, they couldn't start diving. Um, they're often very jealous because they weren't able to, uh, you know, to make uh, uh, the amount of money that the other women would. Um, but yeah, that, uh, that research on the physiology is full of amazing things, especially cold endurance that uh, women divers are capable of. Uh, that uh, other people are not. And, and uh, for example, uh, before the wetsuit, women die, uh, men in the village, the average amount of calories they would consume is like, you know, 2000 to 2500 a day or whatever, you know, not wartime, but in, in normal time. And uh, the women would consume uh, sometimes up to 4000. And that's because you, you think about these, uh, these divers that train in the water, you're burning a lot more calories. The heat is being siphoned off your body. Now, these women divers would dive uh, up an hour or two in February, in January, in freezing water. And uh, their breathing method has something to do with this. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there's a researcher who passed away in the 80s who did that kind of research on Jeju Island, I uh, think at Universe somewhere in Michigan, I'm not sure, not Ann Arbor, but somewhere. His archives are there, but he has the answers to all these questions. Uh, but there's kind of a, in recent years, just now there's been a, a, a revamping of interest in, in, in um, this kind of physiology uh, research. But the thing is, is that uh, it, it's a little bit too late because everybody's in a wetsuit now. So the, the kind of physical advantages that they had have kind of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a di they're different now than they were 50 years ago. But, but, but records of, of that exist for sure. Uh, Brenda asks, how can we get a copy of your book and documentary on shamanism? Okay, yeah, uh, my book, well, my book on shamanism is available on my website, uh, which I should tell everybody. It's uh, uh, pagansweare.com. So pagans we are. Um, so, and I write about Jeju shamanism there. Um, and the book, this book on women divers is on amazon.com. If you just search my name or if you search the, the title, you should be able to find it. It's an ebook right now. Uh, you know, Corona was going on and uh, I wasn't 
I wasn't sure it was ethical to even print books to have them handled by shippers and, and this type of thing. So uh, I think we're going to do uh, an illustrated version later. Okay. Um, uh, why do you think the divers are in danger of dying out within the next decade? Can you talk for a minute about why the younger generation may be less interested in becoming divers? Yeah, the, the women divers, uh, for the most part, uh, did not encourage their children to become divers. And, uh, you know, the, the people who are in their 40s and down now were not uh, encouraged to become divers. Um, yeah, the uh, new opportunities had opened up for uh, people on Jeju. Uh, you know, the economy had diversified. Uh, tourism had come to the islands. Uh, there was, uh, you know, the option. Tangerines came to Jeju. Uh, and, you know, there was just in the 80s, there were a lot, a lot more money shifted to farming. You know, there, I think in the, in the late 70s, something like 30% of all women divers quit the same year to uh, take on tangerine farming, the shift to that. So the economy shifted and they didn't really encourage their children to be divers. Now, now they're encouraged, uh, you know, diving is promoted for tourism or for more like, um, you know, as, as cultural heritage, I would say. Uh, but, but all of these women I'm interviewing are still, you know, that's, that's their mainstay. They're still uh, making money. That's still their main uh, income is diving. Uh, Joey, uh, James Turnbull uploaded a file of a scientific study done about the Henyo and physiology and all of that. And I've sent that to everyone on chat. It's a PDF that you can download. Uh, so you may be interested uh, in that science of the physiology of the Henyo, everybody. Thank you, James. And hello, James. I've uh, spoke with James long ago through email, I think. Um, Okay, uh, does anybody else have any questions besides what we've done so far? Okay, I think, I think we've, we've covered it. Uh, Joey, thank you. Very interesting and uh, certainly uh, a lot of insight into that culture of Jeju Island. Um, I've, I've been in Korea since 1975, and I've been to Jeju-do several times, and I knew about the Hanyo, but I learned a lot tonight. So thanks very much. We appreciate your joining us. Um, be sure to join us uh, next Tuesday, uh, July 14th, for our next lecture. Uh, we'll have a presentation about Cuban Koreans. Uh, see our Facebook page or the website for some more information. Uh, by the way, we have a new website up, but we're still working out the kinks, so be patient with us. It's the same address, raskb.com. And thank you all for joining us, and have a good evening. Bye now. Thank you, everybody.